Hey everyone, we're uh, we're back again. Hopefully everyone's catching up with the stream there. We just uh, did a little bit of a changeover as we do our shift handover. Um, hopefully everyone's picking up on the on the new stuff. And uh, we are joined by uh, Mr. Perry and uh, Speed to to get the next session kicked off. But Speed had a question for me. Yeah, it's, I noticed over the last few weeks that. These shirts that the Modeler's Life made, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get the thing straight. And when I leaned over like this, I noticed there's something on your ear. What is that? Oh, the, oh my drop bear. This is, this is Shane, my drop bear, who uh, he's carrying. He was carrying a, an Australian flag, but he, he now carries the, uh, the flag of Australian <laughs> cricket, otherwise known as the great sandpaper flag. <laughs> so if everyone can see, he has his sandpaper flag. Our Shane is going to keep up the Aussie side of the th of things while our Aussies have a nap. Well, our next clinician is a prolific scratch builder and working hard towards his MMR. He models old scale as well as in narrow gauge and is building a layout in his house in South Carolina. Welcome to Mr. Scott Perry. Thanks, Pete. Welcome to the Deep South, South Carolina, Fort Mill, just south of Charlotte. Uh, I'm in the Carolina Southern Division of the Mideast region of the NMRA. And today we're going to talk a little bit about scratch building. Uh, I get a lot of questions about it, and uh, it's one of my passions in the hobby. Uh, so glad to share with you. Uh, a lot of people ask me to start off, why would you even scratch build? One of the main reasons for scratch building building is to get a structure or or some uh, bridge or whatever that really reflects the prototype that you're modeling. Uh, I tend to be a more prototypical uh, modeler. I like to build real things that exist. Uh, a lot of people like it for the challenge of being able to, to produce something with your own hands. Uh, a lot of people think uh, uh, that scratch building is a, is a time saver and a money saver. Uh, craftsman kits can be very expensive. It's not unlikely to be $400, $500 for a craftsman kit. Um, it's not always the cheapest thing, uh, but it can be less expensive. It just depends on what you're building. Um, and then a lot of people uh, have taken interest in the NMRA Achievement Program, which I also do. Uh, building uh, models for the structures, you have to build uh, quite a few of them and scratch build several. Uh, you need to draw plans. You need to take photos. Uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done. And it's all about building your skill level, learning more, doing more. Uh, I've learned a lot with the NMRA Achievement Program. I've been a judge for many, many years. Uh, I've evaluated models, and I've had my own models evaluated uh, some here just lately. Uh, I've got a, quite a few more that I've got to finish up here. You'll see some of them today. But uh, I've, I've thought that contests and the NMRA Achievement Program have done wonders to get real honest feedback, uh, ideas, and have somebody point out some of my mistakes so that I can correct them and do better. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons for, for doing scratch building, but it is an enjoyable part of the hobby. Creating is kind of what we do. We build miniature worlds, and to build something uh, I'm proud of it when I build it, uh, and I want to show it to other people. And I found that that uh, the the vast unwashed masses love miniatures, and they love to see a beautiful scratch built building of something they recognize. Um, the next one, how to get started. Uh, one of the best things that I think that you can do is build a craftsman kit. Uh, this is a fine scale miniatures kit. For some of us, these are collectibles, so you don't open them, but uh, I like to build them. Uh, this one is the logging repair shed. You can get it for $100, $150 on eBay. They're still available. But the, the good thing about these are they have amazing instructions and they really are scratch build. So in this particular kit, George Celios gives us, he's the creator of these, he's retired now, but he gives us these amazing instruction sheets with photos, diagrams, and complete details on how to build it, how to weather it, how to paint it, um, 
and all the tricks for building a successful model. Uh, you also get things in the kits, and it's not just fine scaled miniatures. There's many of these. I build uh, Foscale, I build uh, 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 two or three other different bar mills. I built one of his kits the other day. So you get these, these fine templates that you can use to build board by board construction. You get all the wood and everything that you need. And some of this has to be cut, some of it doesn't. And then the true gold, the miniature castings. The details that really, really make it pop. And the instructions teach you how to paint these successfully so that your model looks as realistic as possible. This is a great way to get started. And once you've built one or two of these, uh, scratch building is a very, very easy step up. Another thing to do, there's several ways to learn about scratch building. One of the things that I recommend more than anything is a copy of Bob Walker's book on scratch building for model railroaders. This is available at, from uh, White River Publishing. It's, it's still in print. It's about $25, and it'll be the best $25 you ever spent. Uh, as you can tell, the cover of mine is ripped. The pages are glued together and torn. But in the pages, Bob goes hand, uh, piece by piece and shows you everything about how to build different structures, how to cut, what tools you need, a little bit of everything. Uh, even resin, uh, how to resin cast and make molds. So this is a priceless book. Pick up a copy, teach you most everything you need to know. The other is to build. Uh, literally, the more you build, the more you scratch build, the, the, the better you're going to get. Start small. Build small things and then work your way up. Uh, one of the other clinics that I teach is the Bullshoot Clinic. And uh, uh, I've taught this in three different regions now. Uh, it's a very simple project. It takes about six to seven hours. But we start with just pieces of lumber. We stain them, we cut them, we have plans, and we build a very, very simple bull chute. This is for loading cattle onto a stock car. Start with simple, simple things like this. Build them in multiple scales if you like to, to try different scales. Which scale you build in really doesn't matter. There's some unique things if you go down into the smaller scales, uh, some very unique things if you start going into the larger scales, like seven and a half inch gauge. Uh, but all of these can be built. This same model can be scaled up and built in any size that you want. So get started with a few projects like this. Here's another one then. I built this one just the other night. It's a, a, just a small trestle bridge that goes over a creek. And I'll use this on my layout. Uh, I built the, the bents by hand, which is these, this part right here. I built the bents. I put in the, the nut and bolt or the bolt and the washer castings. I hand laid the track. And it's a very, very small piece. And these little things like this, you can build in an evening or two. And if you don't build them to your satisfaction, you toss them in the trash can, you start over, build it again. The other thing, you've got the NMRA. So the NMR way, uh, NMRA website, you can find a wealth of talent. There are master model railroaders that have got a wide variety of skills over the hobby. Uh, you'll find other people that specialize in different things. If you have a problem, ask. Uh, if you've got a problem putting corners of a building together, ask others and see what they do. I, you know, I have found that model railroaders are some of the most wonderful people in the world. Uh, I was talking with Gordy last night uh, about the very thing and our experiences uh, at different NMRA events and that type of thing. I've never seen a model railroader that wouldn't help me or wouldn't show me their layout if I ask. So just ask the question. You'll find out that they're very, very helpful. And then the NMRA, uh, the, the internet is full of information. Uh, YouTube has amazing amounts of videos that you can see on almost any topic in any scale. So I'm in O scale, I model O in 30, 
but I also build models for other people in N scale and G and pretty much anything else. So I've modeled S, I modeled N and N in three. So I built a little bit in everything and building in different scales helps build your, your abilities as well. So let's talk about tools. You won't find a scratch builder that's not a tool junkie. I'm the worst. Tools are heroin to me. Uh, if I swung the camera around back, you'd see two fully stocked workbenches full of everything in the world. I use 10% of the tools. You don't need a lot of tools to scratch build. I'll give you a demonstration. This is my travel toolkit. This is what I take on vacation or if I'm uh, on a longer work assignment, I can be stationed at a factory for many weeks. So I'll go and take this with me in my check luggage and I'll build models in the evening. And this is all I need. I have, you may not be able to see it too well, but uh, there's cutting tools, there's brushes, there's drills, there's uh, uh, different angles and, and squaring devices, measuring stuff, a little bit of everything. but I can build most anything I want with just a few tools that are in this case. So you don't have to get started with a lot of tools. Now, as you get better and as you get more interested in it, you may want to buy some special tools. So I like to uh, build in wood. Uh, I tend to do that more just because of the era that I model in. I model in the 1900, uh, right around 1901. So I use a lot of wood to build. Uh, so I have more tools that are around that type of thing. I generally get tools that help me build quality. And I buy quality tools to do that. Um, especially your basic tools. Don't skimp. Buy the best you can get. Uh, I know sometimes that uh, some of the companies that sell miniature tools, the prices are very expensive. But those tools are specially picked and usually very durable. I have many tools that are still here that I use that I had when I was 15 to 16 years old starting in scratch building. I also have tools that I've made. Uh, things like, like this. This is a fixture or a jig um, that I use to make uh, the trusses for this little model. So this is a model of a, uh, it's going to be a doctor's office when I get through. It will have a full interior, but you can see all the trusses are there. Now to build a truss is not that problematic, but to build about 14 of them that are all the same size, all exactly the same angles. There's several angles that have to be cut on this. And then the little precision uh, knockout that's got to be there so the center beam can be put in. Uh, can be quite problematic. So what I did was I created a jig out of plastic. So if I build in wood, I make a plastic jig so they don't glue together. If I'm building in plastic, my jig is made out of wood. And this little tool, it takes just very little time to actually produce one. And most of the time it's made with uh, scrap pieces of plastic. I will get this built and then reproduce the trusses rapidly. And then I keep this in case I want to build a similar building sometimes. While I've got the model here, you can also see internally that all the walls are built board by board. And then I have on the workbench over there all of the detail parts to put in there, including the doctor, the nurse, the patient, the desk, and the table for the, for the patient to sit on. So all of that will be in this as well. And then this will be entered to uh, the, the NMRA Achievement Program so that I can get evaluated and get my points for a scratch built structure. So other tools like uh, the computer. I use the computer quite often. Uh, software for a CAD system. I draw a lot of my own drawings. Um, I'm not great at it, but I can do well enough that I can get the general outline of the building. Uh, I also use uh, other tools. Alexa, what is 10 feet divided by 87? 10 feet divided by 87 is 1.379 inches. 1.379 inches. So Alexa will actually do scaling for me. And I can do this while I'm doing the work and building without having to stop, pick up a calculator, and figure out what a dimension is. 
So think about your electronics that you use. I use cameras heavily. There's nothing that will tell you that something is wrong faster than a digital photograph. So take your time and use the camera and take pictures of what you built and then blow them up and look at the details. Uh, if you want to see a fingerprint smudge on a building, it will show it. Uh, a little bit of uh, glue on a, on a window, the, the camera will pick it up. So it's a great way to fine tune your skills. A lot of folks that ask me, where do I get my ideas from? Uh, I tend to model specific prototypes. So right now I'm modeling the Lancaster and Chester Railroad in South Carolina. At one time in the 1900s, it was, uh, or before 1900, it was narrow gauge. So I'm modeling 1901 when the narrow gauge was just getting ready to start changing over to standard gauge. So I have research that shows the buildings, that shows the structures, it shows the bridges, everything that I need to do to model. So when you model the prototype, it's very, very easy to find uh, uh, prototypical uh, photos and things to build. Some people like creative. Uh, they like to build things that are unusual and different and very creative and eye appealing, which is great too. I do that sometimes as well. That comes mostly uh, for me from photographs. Uh, a lot of them I take myself. I actually go out and when I travel, uh, now with a cell phone, I've got a camera with me all the time. So I can stop and take a photo of an unusual building. Some Sunday afternoons, I will literally go out, pack a lunch, grab my cameras and go find uh, uh, buildings by the railroad and take photographs of them. And I store them in my computer. Uh, oftentimes I'll share them on, uh, uh, there's a one group that's uh, called Begging to be Modeled. And you can find a lot of unusual prototype uh, buildings, photos on that. And then on my website, I'll often post those photos. My website is the Model Railroaders Notebook slash blogspot.com. So you can go there or type in Scott Perry, the Model Railroaders Notebook, and it'll pop up. And you'll find photos after photos after photos of prototypes that you can use. Sometimes I know uh, what I want to build, but I'm not real sure about it. Uh, one example is I wanted an engine house, but I wanted an open air engine house. And I wasn't really sure uh, what it would look like, and I didn't have a prototype. And my friend Brooks Stover uh, writes articles on his S-scale layout, which is just absolutely amazing. It's a work of art. And I saw that he had a, a, an open-air warehouse, a pole barn type where, uh, uh, engine house. So I just wrote him, and uh, I said, look, I'd like to build that. Is there a prototype? So he goes, yeah, sure. So he sends me a photograph of this really cool open air engine house. And I'm like, yep, that's exactly what I'm wanting, Brooks. Can you send me the drawings or do you have any dimensions? Oh yes, yeah, Scott, I've got them. A friend of mine went by there and drew them. So I have a complete set of, of, of drawings. They're rough, so they're not to scale, but I have all the dimensions on there so I know what I'm building. So the next thing I do as I sit down at the CAD system, I use uh, Third Planet for my for my CAD and for my layout design stuff. I do some layout design work on the side, but uh, I designed my own uh, engine house with the little side building. The actual prototype has this too, but it's not this big. So I've got a little warehouse uh, slash building house on the side. So here is the model that's under construction. I've still got a little ways to go, but it's starting already to look like the prototype. On this side, you can see where the, the shop is about to go. All of this is board by board construction and the complete interior of this operation will be detailed. So I've got probably another two and a half months before I wrap this one up. This one will be a, a, a centerpiece on my layout. And I've had a lot of fun building this. Building an O scale is, is a lot of fun. It's a little more challenging because the wood is thicker, but uh, the, the, the scope of it, the size of it is a lot more fun. So that's one way that I get ideas. Another is just sheer need. I needed a water tower, but O scale water towers, when you look at the real size of them, they're enormous. They're very, very big. And with ON30, 
you the the engines don't need that much water. The they're they're going to be smaller. If you've uh, looked at any kind of narrow gauge, most everything is kind of scaled down to size. So what I did was I went on the internet and I just started looking for prototype photos, drawings, that kind of thing, and I put an amalgam of these together to build the Lancaster and Chester water tower. This is built completely from scratch. The only parts that, that were purchased were some old pulleys that were from an old ship model that I had and some uh, bolt and washer castings that are put on here. Everything else was pretty much made with these. This is a box of wooden coffee stir sticks. For 450, you get an entire box of 20 foot long O scale planks. They're already rough and weathered for you. They're ready to go. And I build a lot of things with these. And I'm still, this box, I still haven't hardly made a dent in it. And I built about five models with it already. So all of the, the, the roofing shingles are made with that. This is uh, dyed with uh, black stain. That's a uh, shoe dye and alcohol. Uh, this is painted with both paints and Dr. Ben's weathering powders. It's a combination of both. The bands, the steel bands, are actually fishing line from, from my rod and reel. The spout was made from a plastic drinking straw. All of this was pretty much except these, uh, these 12 by 12 timbers. That is quarter inch basswood stock from a local uh, hobby shop. All of this cost about $4.90. Uh, if you bought this as a kit, it would be $45, $50 or more. So it can be cheaper sometimes, but the tools I used to build this probably cost $200. So saying that it's cheaper is not always the right thing, but one of the things I like to do is when you're scratch building is to build with what you have. Um, so in a little bit, we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Now on my layout, I had an ash pit and I'll show you that in a little bit, but I built an ash pit and I needed something to get the ashes up out of the ash pit. So I went and looked for a little crane. I found this drawing and the photos that came along with it for a little hoist. So in a couple of evenings, I sat down and using wood out of my collection and some spare parts, I built a model of this hoist. Now I've got it anchored right now because it's moving around. So when I get it to the layout, this will be moved and, and released. So it'll swing back and forth. Uh, but this is uh, just a, a coil of hose, which is uh, solder, very thin solder. The plumbing here is from scrap parts out of a out of a plastic uh, scrap bin that I keep. The shovel is from uh, Best, uh, uh, I think it's Best Best Railroading or something like that, Bollinger Eddingly or something. Uh, best, if you look it up. Uh, that's where I got the shovel and the bucket. And the rest of the stuff is made out of parts or, or nut and bolt castings from uh, Titchy Train Group. So you don't need to spend a whole lot and you don't need to plan a whole lot either. Uh, I got that drawing. I started immediately putting it together in and about often on about three nights or so it was done and complete and it'll look great on the layout. So none of these projects, the, the water tower is a little tougher because you've got, you've got angle cuts, you've got round objects, and then you've got an octagonal roof. Now that's a little bit trickier, but you'll see plans for that and instructions for that in that scratch building for model railroader book that I showed you by Bob Walker. Um, other ideas I get from books. I have a lot of books on, on railroading. Uh, I like logging. I like uh, the older steam, the smaller uh, short line type railroad stuff. So I have lots of books on those. I borrow books from friends. I trade things with them. Uh, so I'm always looking at photos and getting ideas. And when I see those, uh, I copy them or photo them and put them into my computer and I keep it backed up, but I keep all the files. Uh, my friend Pat Turner's out there in NMRA land. Uh, I bounce ideas off of him and other people. So there's lots of different places to get ideas. One other one that I like, 
that I highly recommend, especially if you're getting started, is this book. This is by Pat Harriman, and it's Early Wood Structures and the Stone Structures. And it is nothing but a book of small buildings. Pat is a wonderfully talented architect, and the photographs in this book are just amazing. And it's all kinds of small buildings that make for just fantastic projects. So if you're looking to get started, one of the things I recommend is a book like this where you've got a lot of little structures that you can build. You can do it with a minimal amount of expense and wood and parts. Uh, and you can do these sometimes in a couple of days. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of evenings to, to put one of these out. One of the best ways, and I, I try to teach this, uh, and I teach a class on it sometimes too, is to build three of the same thing. Pick out one of these little cabins or one of these little buildings and plan to build it three times. Now, don't build them all together at the same time. Build one and finish it. So the very first kit, start off and build it as good as you possibly can. Try to get your corners uh, tight, your roof at the right angle. Try to keep uh, glue and strings off of the model or glue spots. Try to put the windows in nice and clear without any fingerprints, those kind of things. Do the best you can on the first model and then take your digital photographs all the way around the building and start looking for problems. Uh, look and see if the fit of the walls is accurate. Look and see if you have gaps. Look and see what things about that model uh, make you feel like that takes away from the model. When you've done that and you've made a list of those things, go back and build that model again. Take, take your time. Try to not do all the things that you had written down. Try to add more detail to the building. Try to finish it much, much nicer. Pay more attention to your painting, to your staining, to your weathering. And then when you've done that, again, take a set of photos, but get a model railroading friend to have a look at them this time. And again, go through and write down exactly what, what you could do to do better. You can also take it and have an NMRA evaluation. Call your local NMRA achievement program uh, manager or director and have them come out and review it or take it to a uh, contest and have it evaluated and get professional critique on it about what you could do better. Next time, build it a third time. This time, try to build it for a contest quality model. Put more detail into it, put more time into it, Make a little change to it and somehow change the roof line, add another chimney, do something a little bit different to it and add more detail again and make it very, very unique. By the time you do that third one, you have developed a lot of new skills uh, already. And it's amazing what the difference will be from model one to model three. Uh, this summer, my daughter and I, she's 10 years old. She wants to learn scratch building. She and I have been building models together for quite a while. So I'm going to put her through this very program. We're going to do the exact same thing. And eventually I'll pay, post these photos so everybody can see them. The next thing about scale model railroading and building structures like this and, and scratch building is actually developing the skills. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about cutting. Uh, no, I'm not going to cut you, but what I am going to do is move the camera just a little. So we can get a look here at, uh, at the workspace. If you're going to cut, most all of us will use the hobby knife. We've, we've all got an Exacto, an Excel, or some other kind of hobby knife. And when we use it, we go to cut. And we generally just make a make a cut like this, and there we've made our cut. Now, a couple of problems with this: one, this blade is not sharp. If it was sharp, I would have cut through that like that. So, what we're going to do? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to buy and keep a box of blades. Uh, buying one or two is not a good thing. I, as a rule. Every time I sit down to my workbench, 
the first thing I do is replace my hobby knife blade, or I at least do it frequently. And we'll put this new one in. Now, when I put the blade in, it's always going to be coated in a light coating of oil. Uh, you may not see it. You may not feel it. Let me put my glasses on here. It's the only bad thing about being an older model railroader. So we put this in, and the first thing I want to do is take some paper or whatever. I'm off the side on a piece of paper, and I wipe off the oil, and I get that out of the way. So now we come back to cut. And the cut goes right through, and it even goes into my cutting mat. Now, when I press down like that, I am more cutting, and I'm more breaking the board than cutting it. And I leave what's called a curve. So when I cut, I'm not cutting straight down and getting two halves. I'm peeling away the board. And on the board, now I'm going to have two slightly slanted uh, sides on either board. So that's not real good when you're trying to put these two back together. So what I want to do when I cut, I actually want to slice. Use the power of the blade. Now, normally I'd have a, a little metal piece here uh, guiding my blade so I get a nice accurate cut. But I want you to see what I'm doing. But I made three passes, and now I have a much, much cleaner cut. But still, even with the X-Acto knife, I'm, I'm not quite getting the, the cut that I want. You can may not be able to see, but I've still got some rough edges and things right here because this blade is still fairly thick and not really as sharp as like maybe a scalpel. So more often than not, if I'm making a cut like this, I'm using a single edge razor blade. Now the ones I use are stainless steel. They're not the regular carbon steel blades. So they're thinner and they have a little more edge on them. They're a little bit sharper. So that didn't quite get through. So two cuts. Now that edge, you probably can't see it too well, but it is razor sharp. It's nice and clean. There's no fur or anything on the edges. So slowly but surely, I'm cutting a little bit more precise. And that's what scratch building is all about. Continuous improvement. You're always building your skills you're always getting better. Now, you can stop with tools just like that and build beautiful models, no problem. But when you start building something like a trestle, a trestle can have 1,500 boards in it or more, and each one cut with an angle. So what I do is I start looking for tools that can replicate the same cuts. So this is uh, the Northwest Shortline Chopper. You can get it from Northwest Shop Shortline. Micromark has a version of this. And it is another razor blade cutter. It's got a blade right here. And what you do is you can put it in. If I want to cut a one-inch board, I put it to the one-inch side and press down, and boom. I've got a cut. Now, this one, even though it's got a new blade in it, has left a little bit of a... a a shard there and whatever. So I might have to take a piece of sandpaper and sand them off. But that's another way to do it. And this tool is right around $50, I think. So in an effort to constantly get better, to get more accurate and more accurate, uh, I use one of these. Now, these are out of production, but this is called the caliber cutter. And what it does, if you can see here, it moves the razor blade in a slicing uh, method. Instead of coming down and breaking the board, it's using the blade's ability to slice. So when I put this on, I can set the stop to where I want it and then slice through the board. And I've got an old blade on that one, so it didn't cut all the way through. So I always change your blades. Do what I say and not what I do but it will slice it and I can create specific ones off and on, on, on and on that way. Now, this isn't available, but there is one that's coming out. So I heard that uh, I'm about to get a prototype of one of these to uh, test. And uh, it's of the similar thing. These haven't been made for like 20 years, but this new one's coming out 
and it moves at angles and it's much, much easier to use. So when that comes out, I'll give you a review of that one as well. The latest thing that I've been playing with, oops, there we go. This is the Ultimation Sander. Uh, I bought mine from uh, uh, Fast Tracks and I just got it recently. And what it does is it precision cuts and or sands uh, a board to the proper angle and the proper length. So what I've done is I've cut a board uh, right here, just a, a simple square. And I've set up this tool. This is called the repeater. I've set up this repeater to put this in and make this precision piece. And what we do here is we just put it in. Now this is not a power tool. It's manually cranked. That sounds crazy, especially for the price tag, which is about, I think with the repeater, I paid almost $300 for this. And I thought it myself at the time that I was absolutely crazy for buying this until I actually used it. The crank allows you to put the right amount of pressure and speed on the wood so that it doesn't fracture or crash or break or burn. And then you start sanding. As you sand, this part moves in and controls I'm doing this backwards, so it's it's a little harder for me because I'm left-handed, um, and I would normally crank with my right. But I would crank this, and it slowly mills the board down to a proper angle and a proper length. So when you get done with it, I'm not going to crank it because it'd take a while, but you can already see I'm getting a nice angle here. And it'll come down, it will crank the right angle and the right length all at the same time. So this is real handy when you're building something like this. Each one of these bents has two angles, one on either side of the board. So when you're trying to do this, I'll actually cut a length. Now, this is a wooden dowel. This is not uh, uh, the, uh, the lighter basswood that I'm using. <clears throat> so cutting these is much, much more difficult. So what I'll do is I'll cut several of these that are a little bit long. I'll put them on this with a precision angle. I'll sand off one end until the angle is nice and clear, flip the board around, sand the other angle, and now I've got these two angles here. And it's hard to see because this is a very dark model. This is all creosote and everything in the bottom of the swamp. But when you look at it real up close, you can see that the angles hit the top and bottom of the bent perfectly. Uh, it's the most amazing thing in the world. So if you want to make a lot of trestles and a lot of precision type angle cuts, this is the perfect thing. Uh, when I showed you the engine house just a minute ago, it, it was covered with these type things. So this is a very expensive tool as is the caliber cutter. That's a $250 device, even if you can find it. But when you're doing mass production or building large things like an enormous trestle, uh, it saves a lot of time and gives you a lot more precision than just hand cutting. So it really just depends on what you like to build and, and how much you're going to build. All right, let's talk about uh, materials for a little bit. I'm going to set the camera back to about where it was. So I keep a supply of materials all the time. Uh, I build in both wood and plastic and metal, so I keep supplies of all of them. Uh, behind me here is a huge uh, bin full of wood uh, and plastic. So I buy my wood strips. Uh, mostly I get them from Mount Albert through Fast Tracks, but I also get them from other uh, uh, suppliers as well. Northeastern is out there and a couple of others. And I'll buy them in bulk. So I buy a large quantity, and I'll buy like some every month. I also purchase... Scribe sheet wood, uh, clapboard, uh, scribe siding for like boxcars or freight cars, that kind of thing. And I keep a supply of these all the time. Now, normally you'd have some time to order them or whatever, but I was very thankful when the COVID outbreak hit 
because I have a fully stocked hobby shop here and I don't have to run out. I can plan and build something right now and I don't have to uh, scrounge around for parts. What I usually do is I keep a supply of all the building materials, but I don't keep the, the detail parts. And I order those specifically for the model. So I don't keep tons of those. I do have some boxes of them, but like crates and normal things that would be out. But uh, I, I'll always order those uh, especially. Plastic, I keep uh, sheets of styrene. Every time I go to the hobby shop, I pick up a couple of packs. You know, you spend a little $10 more, whatever, it helps the hobby shop. And I slowly build up a collection. So right now, I could build you almost anything you wanted if you gave me a phone call. Uh, not that I'm building uh, professionally anymore. The detail parts. Uh, probably of all the things scratch building, the thing I like doing least is painting detail parts. I generally wait till the very last minute and I do it begrudgingly, usually in front of the TV. But I'll take the parts and I'll put a primer coat on these. This is uh, Rust-Oleum's 2X paint and I'll spray them real good. If I have a lot of parts, I'll airbrush them. Uh, I'll take one of the airbrush uh, base coats and I'll, and I'll airbrush them all because I get a lot more detail that way. But I'll take these and then I glue them onto a little cork so that I can handle them better and paint them. I will also, I don't know if you can see this or not, this is very, very tiny. Uh, this is a, a bench vise in O scale that's got two different paint colors on it. I use a pair of uh, a positive grip tweezers and these are kind of heavy and they got a wood grip on them so that it's easy to hold and I'll paint with these as well. Uh, here's another one. This is a pot belly stove that's gonna go in the doctor's office uh, that I'm just painting black. So I paint all of these usually at a, at a large bunch of them at a time, 24 to 50 detail parts at a time. I'll paint all the greens, I'll paint all the silvers, I'll paint all the blacks all at one time and usually over a, a week. Some of the other things that I like to, to use as building materials are these. These are from uh, uh, Dr. Ben's Scale Consortium. They're called baby building blocks. They come in multiple colors. I don't know if you can see those there, but they come in multiple colors and they're little blocks, uh, just little squares and they're different size. And they're wonderful for building things out of, especially things like this. This is my ash pit. Uh, this is going to go on the layout, and I just basically took a base of plaster and started stacking the bricks up till I got what I wanted, the stairs and everything else, and then the rusty metal is all made with either brass or plastic uh, bars, and this is all apart and not detailed or not uh, totally weathered yet because I won't do that until it's actually installed in the uh, in the model or into the, the bench work because this goes below ground. So once that's in, then I'll put the final touches and coating and details on it. So that's another way to, to do those. I also keep supplies of detail parts. So this is my Titchy part box. Uh, every time I order something from the Titchy train group, I'll order five or six more things as well and keep a stock. <clears throat> I've also bought a couple of full sets of uh, just miscellaneous parts. Like for $80, you can get a bag full of assortment. So I have those in here as well. And I've got everything from doors and windows to uh, nut and bolt castings, to eye bolts, to small parts for a crane, a little bit of everything. <clears throat> and I just keep building these. Every once in a while, if I go to a, you remember when we used to go to train shows? I used to buy a, uh, uh, a handful of these parts. I can usually get them on sale and I just keep building the supply. I have boxes full of these and grant line parts and also laser cut parts. I'm building more and more with laser cut windows and doors. I love them. Uh, it gives much more variety, uh, a lot more depth to it and they're easier to paint. So pick yourself up some of these, slowly build your collection and you'll find that scratch building is much, much easier. Speed, how am I doing on time? Well, that's good. I can't hear you. You're too far away. You need to come over here.
It's so deep in the helix. Sound takes a while to get out. Uh, how am I doing on time? You are right out of time because we have some questions for you. Very good. All right. I'll stop there. Let's shoot. The um, I, I don't, you know, sometimes we have to be careful that we don't know if it's an inside question or inside joke, but someone wants to know what happened to the hog railroad. What happened to the what? The H O G R R. So the hog railroad, that was the heart of Georgia railroad. That was a railroad that I designed for a friend. I've, I've been designing railroads for years. I've got several, uh, I've got over a hundred that I've designed for people that have been built. And I did the heart of Georgia railroad for my friend, Steve Berkheimer, uh, as his very first railroad. And we were looking at four by eights and I absolutely couldn't stand it. It, it looked small. The curves were small and nothing really worked. It wasn't a layout. So this, the hog is an actual inside pit operated, uh, layout. That's about eight by 10. And it's designed for operations and for viewing only one section of the railroad at a time. So the railroad seems much larger. Uh, the original one is owned by somebody in Georgia. Uh, it was one as a raffle layout. And uh, so it's in somebody else's hands. But I have uh, a file of over 100 uh, hog-inspired railroads uh, that people have built. It's been very, very popular. Uh, I was working on a book for it, but I never have finished it. But one day I will. So what is your railroad called? My railroad is the Lancaster and Chester Railroad. It's a 90-mile a, a railroad here in South Carolina. It's one of the oldest single-owned railroad companies uh, in the United States. It's been owned by the same company since uh, before 1900. Uh, it was a narrow-gauge railroad up until 1901, and uh, it's still... Uh, it's a standard gauge railroad now, of course, but it's a, a modern uh, short line railroad that is very advanced uh, and it has a lot of chemical traffic, paper mills and other things on the railroad. So it's been a very, very interesting uh, railroad to study. So I get a sense of operations will be. Yes, we'll definitely be doing operations. Um, it's going to be a while before it's built because I'm scratch building everything, uh, including hand laying the track. Uh, I don't use the templates. Uh, I think they're, or the, 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 the jigs, I think they're too confining. So I build everything freehanded onto the layout. So it's going to be quite a while before it's done, but I should have the first eight foot section done uh, probably by Christmas. Cool. Do you mind holding those two books up again and tell us the sure. titles? The first one is, uh, Scratch Building for Model Railroads by Bob Walker. You can get this at White River Publishing. That's the Railroad Model Craftsman people uh, and the Owen 30 Annual people for us Owen 30 guys. Uh, but you can get that from White River and it's about $25 and they have them in stock. I checked before I got on the, onto the uh, program. Bob Walker also has another project book called 21 Projects. Uh, and it's how to piece by piece scratch build uh, 21 different structures. And I have that one too. And it's amazing as well. Cool. The other one is early wood frame and stone structures. This is by Pat Harriman. And this is available on model railroad hobbyist, uh, magazine. That's the online magazine, uh, by PDF download. Um, I bought mine many, many years ago when it first came out. This is like actually book number seven uh, signed by Pat. But this is a fantastic book for ideas for scratch building. I highly, highly recommend it. And it's like $19. It'll be the best 19 bucks you ever spent. Someone found one on Amazon for $800. Maybe it was signed on every page. That's possibly. I've, I've seen <laughs> a few of those, but the uh, like, like mine was signed too, but the uh, you can get the, the PDF download and it works just fine. Okay, and a few uh, few modeling questions. Will you put wall inside walls in the doctor's office? Um, so they're going to be left open. And what happened was the mill needed a doctor. 
Uh, they had some plant injuries. The bill was running at full capacity at 1900. Uh, and they, they were having injuries and they realized that for such a large facility with a thousand employees coming in night and day that they really needed a doctor. So the craftsman for the company built a, a doctor's office real mm -hmm. quick to attract a doctor. So the inside walls won't be finished off because it was built very, very quickly, but we'll put all the interior details in and finish that one up here shortly. Cool. Um, how do you determine the height and length of a building from a picture? There's a couple of different ways. Um, if I'm lucky and taking the pictures myself, I carry what's called a story pole, which is a our two five foot lengths of pipe, a two inch pipe that are put together to make a 10 foot long pole. And every section of the pole is divided off by a foot. One foot is black, one foot is white. And I put that up by the building so that I can scale from that. Cool. If I don't have that, it's an older building, then I use the doors and the windows uh, to figure out the average size. So, you know, you can tell roughly how big the, uh, a freight door is on a, on a, uh, station or the station doors and I'll scale from those. If it's a rail car, I'll use the wheels. Okay. Something to scale with. Mm -hmm. Um, someone has trouble cutting in a straight line. Any suggestions on how to, uh, make that better? Yes. Always show if you can. I use three or four different things for cutting straight lines. There it is. And my hero, Bob Walker, told me this in his book. This is a scale rule. Um, it's either the mascot version or one of the others. And I have glued a wooden board down the middle. I tend to use the O, sky, o side more. So what I do, I put my fingers behind this to protect them. And then I will cut along this edge. So I've got a nice steel straight edge to cut along and I get a pretty good shot. Now, if it's a larger board, uh, I actually have a miniature table saw. I have the Micromark uh, uh, Tilt Arbor table saw. And you think, oh my gosh, that's $300 dollars. <laughs> I mean, it's outrageous. And I, I, I bought, I was married at the time and I had to like do a lot of chores and everything to get permission to finally buy it. It has been one of the best tools I've ever bought and I use it all the time. I, I'm, I'm amazed at how often I use it. I also use uh, different uh, squares and rectangles. Um, I even use um, some of the, the other normal tools that you would use for construction. Uh, there are quite a few different things, but Put your work down and cut safely. Always think safety. Uh, I was here playing with these. I didn't have my uh, safety glasses on, but I do wear them. I was scratch building uh, or tan laying track and got a spike into my eye and got an Ooh, infection. Ouch. So I'm real big about always having glasses or some kind of safety thing on my face. So I see the next guy already showed up. Uh, before you go, can you just tell us how, how we can get to your blog? And then I want to say thank you very, very much for your time. My pleasure. Learn something new. So I'm Scott Perry. You can get me on Facebook. I'm, I'm easy to friend. Send me a friend request. I'm glad to help you. And I often <clears throat> post whatever I'm working on on my Facebook page. So things like um, the water tower and all, you can see all the construction photos from beginning to end. So all there are on there. And then my blog is the model railroaders notebook slash blogspot.com. And you can search for Scott Perry, the Model Railroaders Notebook. It's been around since 1998. And uh, it was a, first a website and then a blog. And you can find layout plans, drawings, and model production photos and help. Feel free to reach out to me anytime with a question. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay.